My name is Joshua, and I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm going to be preaching today from Mark chapter 13. So if you have a Bible, please turn there, and if not, I want to let you know there's some Bibles in the round tables in the back. You can get up now and grab one of those, and if you don't have a Bible, you can take one, and that'll be our gift to you. And I got to admit, as we come to this passage, if you have ever been at a moment in your life when you think, I'm discouraged I'm depressed, I'm afraid, I'm anxious. I think I'll read the Bible. And you do one of those like flip through the pages and just put your finger down. If you come to this page in the Bible, chances are you're gonna flip again. Um, This is a passage about, in some ways, the apocalypse. And many churches have taken opinions on this passage that have become their core theology. Um, And there's a lot of rabbit trails, and there's a lot of intrigue over this passage, and and some people, there's a lot of fear over this passage. So as a disclaimer, as we come to this, I just want to say that there are lots of questions that this raises, and I will not answer all of them. Um, But maybe we'll see that this is exactly the passage we need when we flip through the pages of the Bible looking for something to encourage us. I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 8 of Mark chapter 13 and verses 32 through 37. And as Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus said to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he. And they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, Do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of birth pains. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard Keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he, suddenly, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to you all. Stay awake. This is the word of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Christ. Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts here together will be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Give your spirit now to apply this word to our hearts and bring your kingdom here on earth. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, we live in strange times. You hear this passage and you hear... Wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famines and you turn on your TV or you walk out the door and you see all of those things. You see kingdom against kingdom. You hear of wars and rumors of wars. You hear of earthquakes. And if you add to this list, you can add to this list wildfires all over the world just in this past month. And many of you here know what that looks like and feels like and smells like because you live through the Thomas fire. And many of you told me one word to describe your experience. You said it was apocalyptic. The sky was dark. You could smell the smoke. It looked like the end of the world as we know it. And it's true. If you read the news, paper in one hand, and Mark 13 in the other hand, you may look around and say, this is the end of the world. We are living in the end times. It's the end of the world as we know it. And it's easy to understand why you might say that. 
because there's plenty of evidence. There's plenty of disasters, and we can add to the list the things in our own time that make it seem like the end of the world. It's also easy to understand how people here in Santa Barbara may have said that on June 17th, 1859. Do you know what happened on that day? The city of Santa Barbara was only a few thousand people at the time, small town, and it was the day that hell came to earth, as they described it in the newspapers. It was, one of, it was actually at the time the hottest day on recorded history, 133 degrees here in Santa Barbara. I recently heard this story, and I admit I thought it was a tall tale, so I looked it up, and turns out the record is, is true. The, the, it, the, the record of this day is that it was about 80 degrees in the morning, and these hot winds blew over the Santa Inez Mountains, and as they did, birds started to fall from the sky. Animals crowded under the shade of trees, and those that couldn't find the shade of trees jumped into wells and died there, looking to escape the heat. A fisherman was out at shore, and he rowed to the shore, and when he, when he came in, he had blisters all over his arms from the heat. Everyone closed their doors and their windows because they thought, this is the end of the world as we know it. The end is here. Now, the veracity of some of that story has been debated. We don't know exactly what made the mercury in that thermometer go up to 103 degree, 33 degrees, but it's been recorded. It's on history. They thought it was the end of the world. Hell had come to earth. It's also easy to see how the people of Lisbon may have thought the same thing on All Saints Day in 1775 when an earthquake hit off the shore and destroyed immediately 85% of the buildings in the city. People ran to the docks to escape the disaster, to think, if we can just get to the shoreline where there are no buildings, we'll be saved. And they saw the water pulling away from the shore, exposing shipwrecks, ancient shipwrecks on the bottom of the ocean floor, only to then see the wave come back as a tsunami that flooded half the city. The other half of the city was on fire. It erupted in what's called a firestorm because of all the candles lit for All Saints Day. 30 to 40,000 people died on that day, and it left a huge mark on the face of Europe and changed the way people thought about things. They thought it was the end of the world. It's easy to understand why they might have thought that. It's also easy to understand how the citizens of Jerusalem in the year 70 AD may have thought that this is the end of the world as we know it, because in 70 AD, the Roman army laid, laid siege to the city of Jerusalem, killing thousands, burning the city, trapping them there, starving thousands more, and eventually destroying the temple itself, just like Jesus prophesied in Mark chapter 13. Now, I could name many other cities who may have thought the same thing. Nagasaki, Hiroshima, Dresden, Saigon, Baghdad, all cities who may have thought this is the end of the world as we know it. The end is here. And I could name other natural disasters and storms and disease, and there's a reason why we call these things apocalyptic. There's a reason why we describe a storm as having biblical proportions. It's because we think it's the end of the world as we know it when we see these disasters. And they capture our imaginations. We have... It's, it's not just the religious who are captivated by the end of the world. It's also our pop culture and our movies, right? We love watching these movies about the end of the world. They captivate our imaginations, which also means that it captivates our fear. What's our response when we see the storms, when we see the fires, when we see the wars, when we think this must be the end? If you're like me, our, our response is fear. I'm afraid. And I think, you know, many people capitalize on that. It's why we, we buy things, right? Because we're afraid we're not going to have something we want. We're, we're afraid when we feel like something we love is at risk. We're afraid when we feel like our lives are vulnerable, when something good is going to be taken away. And in some ways, it's, it's right to be afraid of death and disaster. But in particular, when we think about the end of the world, tends to make us afraid. I remember when I was 12 years old, 
I had finally convinced my parents to let me play football. And Friday night was coming, and I put on all my pads, and I put on the uniform, and I stood in front of the mirror, and I prayed, Jesus, do not come back before Friday night. (laughs) I just want one game, one chance to wear my uniform. See, when, when something we love, when something good is at risk, it brings fear. And we look around at the world and we see all these things that we love and these people that we love and we think of the end, it's easy to see why it makes us afraid. So what do we do when we're afraid? What do we do when we're afraid of the end of the world? We build bunkers. Now, I don't mean necessarily like that's what we do, although if you do have a bunker and the end of the world does come like this, then anything I say here hopefully does not preclude my invitation to your bunker. Um, I will accept an invitation to your bunker if you have one, and we need it. We build bunkers, we buy guns and store up cans of baked beans um, to prepare ourselves. We want to be protected. We don't want to be vulnerable. We want to prepare for the end of the world. Now, Recently, I saw in my Facebook feed, actually this past week, an ad for an earthquake-proof bed. Um, the bed can detect seismic activity, and when it does, it, it sort of pulls you down into a chamber and closes over on top of you, and there's water and oxygen stored and food underneath, and it sends out a signal for help. And you know, my first thought was, I need one of those. I just moved to the West Coast. There are earthquakes here. I've felt one. That was my first instinct. And there's a reason why, you know, people make these things and make bunkers and sell them is because we want to be safe. Now, you may not have a literal bunker. And you may be thinking, I'm actually not that afraid of the end of the world. That's not what keeps me up at night. But other things keep me up at night. I'm afraid of losing the things that I love. I'm afraid of losing good things. I'm afraid of disaster. I'm afraid of death. I'm afraid of disease. I'm also afraid of rejection and betrayal and failure. And you may not have literal bunkers that you run to for for help in these situations, but you have something to keep you safe. Maybe it's the right school for your kids. Maybe it's the right job for you. Maybe it's your retirement Maybe it's relationships. I don't know what it is for you, but chances are you have bunkers in your life, things that you run to to make you feel safe. But you never feel safe enough, right? Well, the temple was, a kind, of a, it was kind of a bunker. The temple was a safe place. It was a safe house. It was a strong place. In fact, in this passage we just read, you see the disciples saying, look, Jesus, look at how big these stones are. And if you've ever been to Jerusalem and seen the Wailing Wall, I haven't, some of you have, maybe you've seen these giant stones that were left over from Herod's addition to the temple. History tells us that that he actually quarried stones, some that were 100 tons in weight, to bring them to the temple Some that that you can still see today are 40 feet wide. The temple was a strong house. But it wasn't just just a strong house, even though it had the appearance of a fortress. It was also a place where heaven and earth met. This is the place where God dwelled with his people. And the disciples probably had a lot of memories of the temple. You know, maybe they thought of times that they had visited with their family to worship and to participate in the festivals. Even Jesus, when he was 12 years old, we're told, you know, as a a young man, went to the temple and, and, and was in his father's house. And when his family lost him, he said, you should have looked in the temple. Didn't you know that I would be in my father's house? The disciples had these memories of times maybe where they had seen prayers answered. Maybe times where they had celebrated or mourned in this place. Maybe it's kind of like a, a church camp to you, or maybe even a church where you said, this is where I've had so many memories with God in this place. But they also, they had these past memories, these cultural memories of the temple. They remembered, 
miracles that happened in the temple. They remember even memories of Jesus' life, um, of Jesus' ministry near the temple. But they also probably thought of the prophet Zechariah who was murdered in the temple. Maybe they even thought all the way back to Abraham who had offered his son Isaac here in this place. And so what, what does Jesus do when they're in the presence of this special sacred place? When they say, look at these big stones. This is a secure, safe place. Look at this beautiful building. Jesus says, these stones? Yeah, these are pretty great. These are going to be turned upside down. This place is going to be destroyed. Now, if we put our, our, ourselves in their shoes for a moment, we have to realize how terrifying that is to them. We have to realize how disrupting that is. They've got their memories, their personal memories, their cultural memories, their theological memories wrapped up in this place. This is where you know, the, the most sacred real estate on earth is for them. They probably would have died to protect the temple. And now Jesus says it's going to be all turned upside down. Every stone. This place is going to be completely decimated. And this whole time they've been making their way to Jerusalem. If you remember back on Palm Sunday, we talked about how they're going into the city of Jerusalem and they're thinking, as many would-be messiahs had beforehand, um, they're thinking Jesus is going to march into Jerusalem and he's going to reform the temple. And he, maybe he's even going to instate Peter as the high priest. Peter, the rock that Jesus named him. And maybe even in this moment, Peter is looking at these big rocks thinking, this is why Jesus named me the rock. This is when this is all going to happen. He's going to reform the temple, bring right worship to Israel, and restore our nation to the rightful place that it should be. So when Jesus says, actually, no, this temple is going to be destroyed, it was probably the end of the world as they knew it. See, imagine you're working for a political campaign. You join the campaign, you, you go on these stump speeches around the West Coast, you're campaigning, you go through the heartland, the Midwest, the Rust Belt, the Mid-Atlantic, and you finally come to Washington, D.C. And you're there with the team, with your candidate, and you say, that White House there, look at that, that's going to be ours. The Washington Monument, the Lincoln Monument, the Pentagon, all of these like monuments of, their nation, of our nation's pride, and you say, look, that White House is going to be ours. And the candidate says, that house? Oh no, that house is going to burn to the ground. That house is going to be gone in just a few years. That's what's happening to the disciples. They're political, they're religious, they're cultural memories and dreams and hopes are being turned upside down in this moment. This is a prophecy. And what that means is that Jesus is not just predicting the future. He's not just saying, hey, there's this thing that's coming and I'm going to let you know about it. No, he's saying this is a prophecy. This is God's judgment. It's not just something that's coming. It's something that God is doing. God is going to disrupt this place. God is going to turn this building upside down. In fact, he uses the same language that in the past had been used of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Egypt and Babylon, these cultures that God had judged. And then he turns to Jerusalem, the holy city, and the temple, the holiest place, and he says, this place will be judged. God is going to turn it upside down. And that's exactly what happened. If you read history, if you read the ancient historian Josephus, you see, you can actually hold up Mark 13 and Josephus, and you can see the exact things that Jesus prophesied about the temple happened. Within a generation of those that he was talking to in the moment. Um, the city was surrounded, as I have already mentioned. People were starved. They were actually resorting to cannibalism. Josephus says that half the city is running with blood. The other half is on fire. People are in the tunnels looking for safety. And he said that, that no city has ever seen such destruction as Jerusalem on the day when it was destroyed. And on that day, when it was destroyed, a false prophet came to the city, or a false prophet from within the city, 
said, everybody, get to the temple. He's going to save us. This is the end. God is going to open heaven and bring us up with him. Get, if you get to the temple, you'll be saved. This is the end. And so people flocked to the temple. That was their bunker. That was their safe house. And on that day, the temple was destroyed and everyone in it. But what happened to the Christians who believed? What happened to the Christians who heard Jesus' words? And if we read on in Mark 13, we'll see that, that Jesus actually says, when you hear of this happening, flee the city and run to the hills. And that's exactly what happened. Church historian Eusebius tells us that the Christians remembered the prophecy. They remembered Jesus' words and they fled to the hills. And by and large, the Christian population of Jerusalem was spared because they heard the words of Jesus and they believed and he saved them. And, and what they did after this, after Jerusalem was destroyed, is they scattered all over the known world to the point where Paul even says all creation has heard the gospel preached because the disciples of Jesus from Jerusalem went out into the world. And so through the prophecy, through the destruction of the temple, God's judgment on the temple, God saved his people and built his kingdom on earth and spread the gospel. You know, Jesus has a way of taking our safe houses, our bunkers, our strong places, and turning them upside down. This is what grace does when it comes into our lives. Grace is free and unmerited, and we are saved through no work of our own, but only the gift of grace given to us freely. Yet, that grace is costly. It's disruptive because grace comes in and it judges our faults hopes. It judges our idolatry. It turns our lives upside down. And we begin to be disrupted and to think differently about money and sex and power and families and relationships and work. Grace, when it comes to us, disrupts us and turns our lives upside down. You might even say it's the end of the world as we know it when Jesus comes to our life and redeems us and saves us, and converts us. But he does this not once, but many times, because he is always gracious with us, and he is always coming into our lives to destroy and to judge the idols that we have built. And what do we do when he does that, when grace is painful? Many times we think something good is being taken away. Something I love is at risk. And we become afraid once again. If you're a parent, you know this situation. You plan something really fun for your family that they have zero interest in doing. Um, this actually happened to me this week. Um, I'm new to town. I hear about Fiesta. I want to go and celebrate with the rest of the city. And we're sitting on the front porch. We finish dinner, sitting on the front porch. And I tell my son, Jasper, who's three years old, I say, hey, we're going to go to Fiesta. And he's like, I don't care what Fiesta is. I don't want to go to that. And he says, no, I want to stay here. And I say, no, there's going to be like confetti. There are going to be eggs full of confetti, and there's going to be confetti everywhere. And he's like, I don't know what confetti is. <laughs> and so he's not interested in that. And I'm like, there's men in funny hats that are going to be singing and playing music and women in dresses that are dancing. It's going to be fun, I promise. And he's like, I don't want to go. And I had to pry his fingers off the porch and drag him kicking and screaming like a good father. You will have fun whether you like it or not. Viva la fiesta. And, and, he, and he couldn't imagine it. He couldn't imagine the fun that was before him. See, that's the thing about imagination. That's the thing about hope. That's the thing about the future. It works both ways, right? Fear and hope. I have a poem hanging over my desk. It says, fear and hope, twin destinies lurking over the horizon. See, it's much easier for us to look at the future and be afraid than it, does, than it is for us to look at the future and be hopeful. It's harder for us to imagine the future when the present seems so good. Right? That's what your kids are saying is, yeah, that stuff may be great, but it's in the future. 
It's, it's the future. This is the present. This is what I want. And we do the same things when God tells us about his kingdom and the goodness that he has for us. And even the good ways that he has for us here in this life, we think, yeah, but I don't want to lose this good thing that I have now. And so when grace comes in and disrupts, we often resist it. But there's not just a prophecy in this passage. There's also a promise. And if we we turn to verses 32 through 37, we see the conversation change a little bit. See, a lot of scholars will look at this passage and also parallel passages in the other Gospels in Matthew 24, for example, and they'll say, the disciples are actually asking multiple questions, they just don't know it. See, for them, the destruction of the temple was the end of the world as they knew it. So when they hear that the temple is going to be destroyed, they think, this is the end. And they say, tell us, when is this going to happen? When is the temple going to be destroyed? And when is the end? And Jesus says, I'll answer that question, but there are multiple questions there. The temple will be destroyed, but that's not yet the end. It's not yet the end. In verses 32 through 37, he starts to tell us, but that day and that hour, there he shifts to talking about the end of the world. See, we have the advantage of history on our side. We can look back and say, well, the world didn't end in AD 70. The world didn't end in 1775 or in 1859 or even in November and December of 2017 or even last month. No, the world is still here. So all those things weren't the end of the world. And so Jesus is answering the question of when will the temple be destroyed and when is the end? And he says, to the, an- the answer to that question is no one knows. The angels of heaven don't know, not even the Son, but only the Father knows when the end is. But he promises them that an end will come, that he will return. And in that promise, there's hope. And if we see in, that, in those verses, there's some takeaways. I just want to list out some of the things that we see in the coming of Christ as he promises Not just that the temple will be destroyed, but I will come back. Because Jesus says that his body is the temple. And he will destroy the temple of his body and raise again in three days. And then he says his people, the church, are the temple, living stones. And then in Revelation, the apostle John gets an insight into the the true end. And in chapter 21, verse 22, he looks at, the, the end of this age, when the heavenly Jerusalem comes down, when, when Jesus returns, as he promised, to make all things new, he says, And I saw no temple in the city, for the temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And in these pages, we see a promise, and we see a comfort, and I think it gives us hope instead of fear. I just want to give you a few things to take away from this. The first is that Jesus is the rightful king of the nations. As we've already read, Jesus is the one who receives the everlasting kingdom, the dominion that lasts forever, a kingdom of all nations, all tribes, all languages that belong to him. And so we see that Jesus is the king. And this gives us hope and this gives us comfort because this means that Jesus is sovereign over the nations. So when you feel like your life is completely out of control, when you turn on the news and you feel like there's nothing I can do to be safe enough, to be safe from all these things that are at risk, know that you have a king who's in control. Even if you feel out of control, he's in control and he's sovereign over the nations. There's nothing that can surprise him. There's no war or disaster or earthquake or famine that he doesn't know about. And there's also nothing that can conquer him. He is a victorious king. And we know that in the end, his reign will win. And he will be the king that lasts forever. And that's because Jesus is the key to history. See, he is the key to history. His life, death, and resurrection is the window through which we see all things. And we see that Jesus will return and that everything that we do in life has a purpose and it has an end. See, all the work and all of the the ministry and the serving and the relationship building, all the things we do and the parenting, they're not without purpose and they're not without end. 
this world is going somewhere. There is an end to the story, and it's in the return of Jesus. And so we see that there is purpose and there's meaning, and we know that this is not a chaotic place, not a chaotic world, but a world that is going to somewhere. And then lastly, we see that this king is coming. He has come, and he will come again. And that gives us this posture of hope. Now, you may have heard everything I I said today and think, oh, well, if wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famines and all these things just happen all the time, then I shouldn't expect the end. And there's sort of two pitfalls that we can make. We can make the pitfall of feeling always terrified, always thinking today is the end, and it bringing us fear. Or we can say, I'm just completely apathetic and say, well, I don't even know if Jesus is ever going to come back. And in fact, Peter in his letter references this. He says, some people will come and say, nothing's changed. Jesus on the, on the cross and his resurrection didn't do anything to this world. And he says, they'll even, tell, they'll even say to you, when is he coming? And see, we have 2,000 years of wondering, when is he coming? And the answer to that, Jesus tells us in this passage, is that no one knows, but live like it's today. We should always expect his coming. We should look at the nations and look at the news and say, it could be today. It could be today. We should look around and say, let it be today. Come, Lord Jesus, come. And if we do that, we see that, that this world with all its glory is not, it just it pales in comparison to the kingdom to come. Because in that kingdom, there will be no temple. Because God will dwell with his people. And everything that has cursed humanity will be gone. Our, we have no abiding city here, but we do have a heavenly Jerusalem. And we have a kingdom that cannot be shaken, that's promised to us. And so the posture of the Christian is this expectant, Jesus is coming any day now, and, and it's, it's not just expectant, but it's hopeful. It's not a thing to be afraid about, it's a thing to be joyful. There's a fiesta, there's a party coming, and when it comes, it'll be the end of this world. When the city that we belong to comes, it'll be the end of every city here, which means that every pain, every sorrow, every shame, all the duplicity of our hearts, all the times that we do the things we don't want to do and we don't do the things that we do want to do, all of the fears and anxieties of life, the threat of betrayal and failure which hangs on every moment, the marital strife and the bad bosses and the futile work and the sin that corrupts every single thing that we do, the self-doubting and the self-loathing and the self-aggrandizing And all pride and lust and greed and gluttony and violence and bigotry of this world will be over when that city comes, when Jesus returns. And it will be the end of the world as we know it. And that will be a glorious, hopeful thing because everything that has cursed humanity will be gone. And if we can just get our minds around that, we won't be afraid of the end. We won't cling too closely to our, to our safety here, but we'll live with expectant hope. And we'll pray as the last prayer of the Bible says, come Lord Jesus, come. Because when he comes, we will be home at last. We'll find our city, the city that we were made for. A pastor friend of mine um, wrote a book and he told this story in the book. He said that um, he has four young children. Sorry, he has four sons which is a lot, and they ra- they, their ages were kind of like middle school, high school ages, and one was still in elementary school. And so they kind of, you know, big, big range of children, and he said, you know what, I'm going to do something fun for my family. I'm going to take my sons camping, and it's really cold outside. There'll be five of us, but there's only four sleeping bags, but it's going to be okay because my youngest son I can just sleep in the sleeping bag with him, and he'll be like this little hot water bottle that keeps me warm during the night, so I'll be warm while my kids are freezing, and it'll be okay. So they go camping, they roast their, you know, marshmallows, and they have s'mores, and they go get in their tent, and his sons immediately fall asleep, 
and about an hour goes by, and he realizes this is not working out the way I thought it was. His son, instead of keeping him warm, is now like elbowing and kicking him all night long and tossing and turning, and he can't sleep. He's outside the sleeping bag, and he's cold, and he's thinking, this was a big mistake. This is one of those supposedly fun things that I'll never do again. And he had this thought, you know, here I am sleeping out in, on the cold, hard ground in the woods when I've got a, a warm bed at home. And so he thought, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pack up. I'm going to go home. And so his kids, all, all four sons are asleep. He packs up all their camping gear, puts it in his car. He then goes and gets son one by one in their sleeping bag and puts them in the car, buckles them in. They stay asleep the whole time. <laughs> He packs up the tent, packs up everything, puts in the car, drives home, unloads them one by one back into their beds without any of them waking up. And then he's asleep by 10 p.m. in his own bed. (laughs) He wakes up the next morning and he says, I'm going to make breakfast. I've got the bacon. I've got the eggs. I've got the pancakes we're going to have at the campsite. And he starts to make breakfast. And you know that smell of bacon sort of gets you awake in the morning. And, and so one by one, his, his son started coming down the stairs to the kitchen. And all of a sudden, they kinda, it kind of dawns on them, wait, we were camping. <laughs> How did we get here? And he says, I, I brought you home. It was too cold. I, I brought you all and put you, home, you know, in your own bed. And he says, when the Lord comes, that's the way it's going to be. It's going to be like we fell asleep in this cold, dark world and we woke up at home in our own bed and the bed that we were always made for. And we come to the table, and we feast with our Father, and we know that it'll never end. And we'll live in joy and peace with Him forever. So may the thought of His coming, may the thought of the coming King, Jesus Christ, fill us with hope as we proclaim the end of this world as we know it to a dying world that needs to hear it. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen.